Hello and welcome back to video number two, playing Victoria 3 in my England to America Paradox Interactive Historical Playthrough Mega Series. Uh, playing as America for the rest of the entire series. Again, this is video number two. I'm Admiral Jedi, and we are going to start playing the American Civil War. The very first thing we're going to do in the Civil War is make the choice between playing as the Union and as the Confederates, and so we are going to play the Union. Now before we get started and let the war proceed, let's take a look at a couple of things. First of all, we can see the American aristocratic uh, revolt, right? Um, probably something that's missing here is... Really, Texas did side with the Confederates, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and then Missouri was a bit torn, actually. And uh, there was there was some... Well, you know, that's the thing. Is really in every place, no, there was no state population of people in the states that were 100% this and 100% that. Um, and so you had some states that, um, you know, went this way or that way. Interestingly enough, Virginia, uh, uh, most of the West in Virginia, um, ended up being on the Union side. And in fact, it was their separation from their brothers uh, of Virginia, because this whole... This whole thing used to be just Virginia, uh, that ended up uh, creating West Virginia as a separate state. So I uh, just read that last night. That was kind of interesting. And uh, so there you go. Anyway, so we're going to be fighting against the uh, aristocratic result. Re re ugh. Revolt, thank you. Texas will not be included in it. Uh, there's no choice I could really make on that one, so that's a little bit historically inaccurate. Uh, but we're going to proceed forward with that uh, nonetheless. Now, one of the things I want to do is look at the two marketplaces. Can we do that? I think we can. Okay, so here's their... Uh, them as a country. And here's their market. Okay, so let's take a look and see if there are large imbalances. Like, what are they short of? Is that in any way historically accurate? Because at the beginning of the Civil War, the, the North or the Union had going for it just a massive industrial base. In, in every way, the Union seemed to be the, the favored winners. They had higher population. They had more money. They had a higher industrial base. They had stronger railway transportations. Uh, interestingly enough, the Confederate railways primarily ran east to west. And the Union railways, at least in this area, primarily ran north to south. So that gave them an advantage of transporting troops to their front lines. And what would happen is the Confederates, primarily because they had uh, you know, an agricultural um, economy, had a lot of struggles because their economy was built around moving livestock, for example, from east to west, and then out the ports and up and down the rivers, uh, and pretty soon that was taken away from them. So I am somewhat interested, and we're gonna check back on this a couple of times, to see um, what the markets kind of look like. So let's, let's do a comparison of that. So we've got really high level of 75% market price uh, prices percent market price interestingly enough they have plenty of guns that's not historically accurate the north had way more guns and engines so that just might have been the way that the buildings uh, came out let's go ahead and look at our market and uh get that sorted again by price Okay, so we don't have as many super high-priced items as they do. However, we have a massive dearth of weapons uh, and ships, which is not historically accurate. That was really tough for me uh, to simulate. 
Okay, so everything else is looking pretty good in terms of balance. And one of the things that we're gonna do historically, and we'll go ahead and get this uh, going right now. In fact, let's mobilize all of our armies and let's get our navies going. Um, what we're going to do, why do we have... Oh, this is probably because... Yeah, we're, okay, we're missing commanders, no problem. Um, so what we're going to do with our big fleet here is get this mobilized to blockade. So this was known as Operation Anaconda, that they were going to strangle the South's trade by sea because the South traded a lot of cotton, not only up to the North, um, but also uh, to England and to Europe. So we're also, in addition to um, trying to strangle their trade, I mean, do we even need to embargo them? Or, I mean, aren't we embargoing somebody who we're at war with? I would imagine that we, we already are, that, that being at war uh, with somebody automatically embargoes them. That's a little bit weird because with our big... Um, uh, come on, fabric. It's odd that we could, in theory, start an import route right away with the uh, aristocratic resort, uh, revolt market. That seems weird. So that's what makes me think we're not embargoing them. I'm going to look around a little bit on that for a minute. I really just can't find anything on, um, on uh, embargoing them, so that's kind of... A bummer. Um, but anyway, I'll keep looking around. What we want to do is watch to make sure they don't have any trade routes, and if we do, raid their convoys. So that is something that we are going to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, armies are being mobilized, so we'll wait for them to get fully mobilized. Uh, apparently we have a fair amount of missing generals which we can deal with no problem okay so we'll take a little bit more of a look at the economy here in a minute uh, and try to shore up some of the weaknesses in our economy again this guns and ships is going to be uh, kind of a bummer. Now, the American Civil War is a very complicated, in-depth topic, uh, and even though I am an American, I know very new, no slash new, new and still know very little about it, um, even after all the reading and research, so I'm sure I'm not going to do any tremendous justice to it in terms of like which battles were fought where and who won and who didn't and all that sort of thing. I mean, I, you know, we'll talk about it a little bit. So what I'm going to do is just highlight a couple of key uh, realities, concepts, historical events. The very first battle that was fought, if you can call it that, was at Fort Sumter in South Carolina. And what happened is once the Confederates seceded, uh, not succeeded, seceded, they began picking up as much military and civilian technology and territory and everything that was owned by you know the American government as they po as they possibly could by the Union government. Um, and the very first one that they tried, well, one of the first were, were the were military forts, and you know federal military forts that were in Confederate states. And many of those forts fell immediately. They, there was no bullets fired. There was no territory for many reasons. One, perhaps they were just manned by secessionists. Two, they were understaffed and didn't weren't able to put up any uh, fight or resistance to it. But one of the first forts that held out for a couple days, not very long, was Fort Sumter. Uh, and the, it, the, the geography here, the map is, is not, it was, it was held in like a, like a bay. Really, it was like a fort in the middle of the bay. And uh, the fort held out for a few days, uh, but those were the first shots that were fired uh, in the Civil War, 
where the fort itself was surrounded. Again, the, you can't really see it here. In fact, I might be even pointing in the wrong place, but you know, let's just fake it until we make it. Uh, they were surrounded by other forts, which then basically had been pew, 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 like shooting on the fort from all side, bombarding it from all side. And the United States government tried to resupply, probably by, by sea, the fort to withstand uh, the assault, but they just weren't able to, to do that. And eventually uh, Fort Sumter surrendered and the officers inside and, and men inside were allowed to, uh, to leave. So that's really the first battle of the uh, Civil War. Now, one of the things that I'm going to do to try to simulate history is the following. We're gonna take our armies. How many do we have? All right, we got two in the Midwest, three in Dixie, that surprises me. Okay, so we've got some Dixie troops here. Okay, fine. And the vast majority in the New England headquarters. Uh, nothing in Florida. Florida should have been part of the secession effort. And then a few in, in Great Plains. So what we're going to do is we're going to get those all mobilized to the Missouri-New York front and not the Florida front. And in fact, we're going to let that be taken. Uh, so let's go ahead and just do this. In fact, let's go ahead and just start the clock and we'll kind of we'll raise the clock on this one a little bit. Get our armies moved down here. But what we're going to do with all of them, which is a little bit weird, I admit, is we're going to put them all in defend mode. Okay, there's a reason that I'm doing this, and that is that the primary Union General, McClellan, was berated and ultimately fired by Lincoln a couple years into the Civil War because he really didn't do anything. He, he was too cautious. He was tricked a, a bunch of times uh, by generals, uh, General Lee. And um, I mean, there were, there were times, it was a, kind of a funny story, where it's like when they finally came in to take a, um, a fort or, or an enemy, a Confederate emplacement, McClellan consistently overestimated the troop size of the Confederates thinking that they had hundreds of thousands of troops when really they didn't and that they had massive amounts of cannons and really they didn't. And in fact, he showed up one time and found a bunch of logs painted to look like cannons that were the things, the, the cannons that he um, refused to give chase to. So we're going to actually let them take Florida, defend in the meantime to simulate the inaction in the uh, initial, now that's not to say there wasn't any action. Uh, in fact, there was plenty of, of devastating action as well. Uh, this very, very, very bloody war. Probably the, well, I mean, I think it's the bloodiest war ever fought on American soil. But that is what we're going to, that's how we're gonna start this war is by defending for a little bit. I'm still trying to get started and clean up um, economical issues here and I'm upset because you can see the confederate states of america are literally buying arms from from me uh and this is exactly what i was worried about about happening uh, so if we go to their market and see their trade routes right not mine i'm not i'm not intentionally trading with them they are importing paper from Britain, luxury furniture from France, and munitions from me. But I cannot embargo them. <laughs> so I'm not really sure uh, what to do uh, there. That's a little bit odd. Now, what I can do, and will do and should do, is um, go ahead and find this, um, you know, Let's look around for their uh, trade routes. I don't really know of an efficient way to do this, where their trade routes are. Um, OK, 
okay, let, let me, let, there's got to be a better way. We, we've had a lot of great upgrades with 1.7. I'm sure I'm doing this in a stupid way. I should be able to see what they're doing. So let's, let's take a look. Okay, we're in their market, and I can see the arrows coming in. Um, does it show what's being imported? No. Or at least I'm not seeing it properly. Okay. But we can see incoming from there. I already said, okay, we can see uh, those, you know, those goods, which, which goods they, they are importing. Um, it does say that their, let's see, Trade Center is North Carolina. Okay. So that's here, right? So I guess it would make sense that we would see their shipping lanes because we want to block their import. There we go. Confederate shipping lanes. Okay. Here we go. Um, and now that's... Conf okay, French is... That's... Uh, okay, yeah, here we go. So, so the Confederates are importing these goods on these shipping lanes. All right, so... That is going to, I'm sorry you had to wait through all that. That is going to give us precisely what we need, which is we're going to take the big guy and deploy him here. And then we're going to go ahead and raid convoys. Okay, let's keep going. Well, might as well deal with this. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation. This is a really complicated topic. Um, as we talked about in the first video, really this whole war comes down to slavery and um and everybody like i said in video number one danced around slavery for as long as as they uh, as they could i'm gonna go ahead and pass it just to get it off my um my journal here sure let's pass it twice um i probably took a, a hit on that one but anyway the emancipation proclamation was not passed for a couple of years in and in fact, even though Lincoln had some very progressive stances on slavery, he shied away from passing it right away because he didn't want to make the problem of the secession even worse than it already was. His number one goal was to hold the Union together. He was an abolitionist. He wanted to get rid of slavery, but his number one goal was to hold the Union together. And in fact, he has some quotes. I doubt I can quote them perfectly, so you're just going to have to go with the spirit of it. Where he said something like, if I could, you know, uh, uh, release the slaves and hold the union together, I would do it. If I could not release the slaves and hold the union together, I would do it. But it's in that spirit that he was basically saying, okay, I want to hold the union together. What ultimately ended up happening as the, the war wore on, is it just became super duper obvious that there was never, ever going to be a compromise. Ever. So, Lincoln waited for there to be a significant victory uh, before issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. So that, what we just did was historically inaccurate because we haven't had any victory yet. So, let's, uh, let's go ahead and just keep fighting in fact, I think what we're going to do is just let the clock run uh, on this. Okay, we've moved our navy here. And let's go ahead and just get the uh, the fighting started. And uh, we'll go ahead and see. See, uh, see, Lincoln was the head of the Republican Party at this point. Uh, so that's kind of a bummer. But we will go ahead and uh, beef up the Republican Party. Do we still have an unacceptable government? Sure. Okay. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get the war started. There it is. Now, let's check to see... If I have embargo options now, I do not. Okay. Fair enough. 
So we're going to go ahead and proceed with our military strategy of just doing uh, defense. There's a lot of journal entries. Let me just fast forward this, get these pushed out of the way. Okay, nothing's really going on <clears throat> um, at all. We just had a naval battle where our navy, you know, took out theirs, uh, which is good. And I've begun um, convoy raiding. Okay, this is just a little challenge I was going to give to myself. Uh, well, let me see how many convoys we're going to have, actually. All right. Well, fair enough. I was going to challenge myself to take down all their convoys uh, before staging the next sort of historically interesting thing that I'm going to do. Convoys seem to be going up. Okay, but we are taking down their convoys. All right, fine. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, part of Operation Anaconda was the capturing of Louisiana. So let's give that a shot, actually. Um, we are going to try to do a naval landing of Louisiana. And I don't want to pull my main army off the, uh, the primary front. So let's pull the next largest army uh, and see what that looks like if we can pull that off um, this is not super historically relevant in terms of did this actually happen was there like a hardcore naval well, i mean well it is but it wasn't like a key battle in the civil war i mean it was a, it was a major victory and an, an unrealized one in the civil war we focused a lot we focus a lot historically on you know the land battles uh, and kind of tend to forget about the the sea battles in fact, as part of that, I'm going to interrupt current um, military research and do the ironclad because it was the Civil War that saw the first uh, ironclads, and it was so weird. They were literally sailing ships that had iron plates bolted to them for extra protection. They were barely seaworthy at all, uh, which is kind of wild. All right, we kind of snuck in a little bit there with the uh, Louisiana dealy capture. And then we, it's like we have Louisiana, and then whoop, that, that, I don't know if you saw it, that that dude like snuck back. So that was uh, a bit of a surprise. What we're going to do now is go ahead and switch everything to pushing the front. Uh, and hopefully we can just get this... Uh, one here. I don't know that there's a way to do this uh, in mass, but uh, we'll just go ahead and do it one by one. Okay. And let's see uh, how we're going to do. So we've kind of let them get a bit, you know, higher in, in troop quantity, which is uh, kind of a bummer. Um, I did get this set up, somewhat cowardly, I admit it, uh, where um, I had more military power than they did. And so, you know, that we see there's a large outnumbering. That is accurate, actually. Uh, the Union did significantly outnumber the Confederates. Uh, the Confederates, however, had major successes in the beginning of the Civil War, primarily due to two things the uh, skill of their generals and also they're just straight oomph man they just they 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 were they were all in it they were they had elan is is the term that they just had very kind of gutsy ballsy uh, approaches to to everything and they were they were fighting to win it uh, they they really were and so the confederates had held out against the union against huge odds for a really long time. Okay, what we're going to see is this start, you know, so they, they took Florida, right? We need to move this guy back to uh, here and start doing our... Um, oh, we're still raiding convoys. Okay, that's fine. And let's see if we still have... 
yeah, we have lo well, there's lots of Confederate shipping lanes here. So we gotta get back into uh, raiding the Confederates here. This is, you know, I thought they got rid of this, honestly. This non-stop bouncing back and forth of forces from one place to another. There's only one front, so I'm not really sure what they're doing. They've spent a lot of, the developers of Paradox have spent a lot of time trying to handle this front splitting nonsense, but uh, it's still here, unfortunately. So we're going to go ahead and get this pushed down. Um, one of the, yeah, we're, we're going to go ahead and just, and just keep on pushing this. I think we're going to be stuck at zero for a little while until we occupy all the, uh, all, all the territory. Is that correct? Where's our, oh no, we just went down to negative 13. Okay, so we're not stuck at zero. Okay. Now, as I already mentioned, the, um... The Union actually did suffer major losses and casualties. Eventually, things started uh, turning around. And one of the most famous, if not the most famous battle uh, in the Civil War is the Battle of Gettysburg, which was really the turning point in the war, where the defeat of the Confederacy uh, really led to ultimately the surrender of the confederacy it's, i don't think it was at gettysburg that the surrender occurred uh, but this is really one of the huge battles that turned the tides instead i think that the sort of final battle um that really ended the civil war was fought uh at the app app i think it's appomattox courthouse in appomattox county virginia uh and that is the battle where general lee uh, officially surrendered to the Union forces and led to the conclusion of the Civil War. We're getting close. Um, I think we just have to wait for a full 100, you know, negative 100 countdown here. And uh, that should be coming up shortly. I'll, I'll go ahead and just turn um, recording back on uh, as we get closer to it you can see we're down to negative 81 this is a, a big part of american history i i don't think i did it any sort of justice i'm not really sure i could have um, but here you go this is exactly what happened that ultimately the confederates were defeated in 1865 so we're four years too soon and uh game wise the confederate states of america were annexed re-annexed and uh, and brought back into the Union. It's it's interesting to know that it, President Lincoln made sure made sure to never have the Confederate states identified as their own nation, lest they be able to trade with European powers and forever possibly be lost to the Union. He constantly referred to them simply as rebels. Uh, and so here we go. So the American Civil War is now brought to a conclusion, and the period of Reconstruction now begins. With Reconstruction underway, there's a couple of new journal entries that we have that we're going to look at. We'll go ahead and do this Wild Wild West. Um, talk about that a little bit later. We're going to readmit the secession secessionist states. So if you look now, you realize that these states are um, unincorporated, right? They were kicked out of the Union, or rather they took themselves out of the Union, to be clear. And so we want to reincorporate them. However, there were a couple of major questions that occurred during Reconstruction. And set of questions number one had to do with what would be done for, the, with, for, for and with the former black slaves in the south and question number two was how would the laws concerning slavery and all that sort of thing in the union be enforced on the slaves or on the former slave owning not on the slaves on the former slave owning states and one of the requirements was that the newly passed 13 13th amendment 
which banned slavery, and we, we should have just passed that, I believe, right? Needed to be um, incorporated into the state's constitution by the states themselves. They had to say, yep, slavery will be banned in our, our states. Um, so that's one thing. I'm going to simulate that in a slightly different way. Now, what we're not going to do, not going to do, is this equality for all entry. Uh, because even though we could pass multiculturalism, and indeed that did start happening um, with the, is it the, I think it's the 15th Amendment, and we'll get there, um, that while the federal government did start requiring equality for uh, black people, it stalled out, reversed, in the South, especially with the Jim Crow laws, and really didn't come to reach full fruition until the uh, Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. So accordingly, I'm not going to do this. I think that that would do, uh, frankly, a, a disservice uh, to pretend like we were equal for all uh, starting. It, we, we just weren't. Uh, and so we'll go ahead and look at what uh, we have right now. Um, and there was still racial segregation in place until the civil rights movement in the 1960s, so we are going to leave that in place. If that stops us from achieving the overall Reconstruction Journal entry, then so be it. But what we are going to do is only readmit the secessionist states once the premises behind the 13th Amendment, which bans slavery, the 14th Amendment, um, which said, among other things, where's my handy pocket constitution? I think that was the one that said um, that if you're born in the United States, a natural born citizen, that you have all the rights thereof. I'm paging, I'm paging, where's my 14th Amendment? Eh, all persons born or naturalized. In the, yep, that's the one. Uh, and then it's the 15th Amendment. So 13th banned slavery... 14th was, is large, and it's a large uh, amendment. A and really, what that was, was to basically say, okay, southern states, if you don't allow black people to have the same rights as white people, you're not allowed to then have a, uh, a seats in Congress as well. Like, hey, you can't say, okay, we, we don't have slavery anymore, but still treat black people, you know, like they're uh, subspecies. That's just wrong. But therefore, if you do that, you're not allowed to um, have seats in Congress. That's one of the things in the uh, 14th Amendment. Uh, and then the 15th Amendment ultimately was passed to in 1870. We're not quite there yet, but we're going to work on passing that right now, which is the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged in the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So what I'm going to do to simulate that is we are going to work to pass uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, universal suffrage. Okay, We're going to work to pass universal suffrage. And only when we pass universal suffrage will I readmit the uh, secessionist states. Uh, well, I wonder. I want to do it. Four percent chance is going to kind of suck. So I wonder. Wonder. Do we have any agitate? Oh, I've got full agitator slots already. Enact monarchy. Don't want you. There we go, universal suffrage. Okay, so let's go ahead. Do we not have a movement to pass universal suffrage? We do. Let's pass it. Okay, we're going to get started with this, and then when this passes, uh, we're going to start readmitting states. December 1863, and we are getting close. And in fact, so close, we got there. We passed universal suffrage. Uh, this would simulate the 15th Amendment of the Constitution, which didn't get ratified until 1870, actually, so not historically accurate, at least at this time period. And so what we're going to do is begin readmitting each one of the 
states. Unfortunately, there's no easy way that I know of to do this. Um, and it's really easy to forget about Washington, D.C. Where are you? There we go. That one that one bit me for a while, where it's like almost all of them are readmitted, and they weren't. So anyway, <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and just keep readmitting states, uh, and this will constitute our reconstitution of the United States of America following the Civil War. We're getting done with this video. Uh, we're going to go through some industry stuff next and then close it out. We're going to let the clock one run quite a bit, actually, to get us caught up to um, our next event in time. Uh, with the clock ticking down on Reconstruction, uh, I think we're pretty much going to fail. Been trying to readmit the secessionist states. As you can see, all of them are incorporated at this point. But this whole Dixie loyalty dealy um, was really hard to do. Now, it's possible that that could be considered historically accurate because for a long time, the southern states essentially had military governments imposed upon them. And um, the more money that went into the southern states, the more effort, eventually, uh, it just kind of... Uh, I don't even know how to say it. People just kind of gave up frankly. So uh, that whole event just sort of sputtered to a non-issue. We're pretty much going to close this out because, uh, again, the Civil War and Reconstruction have taken a lot of our uh, effort. So the next thing that we're going to focus on for the remainder of this video is really the industrialization of the United States. And that is like huge uh, that that's something that happened very big all over across the united states and there's two things i want to talk about one is again this continued westward migration now i have one final railroad queued up here in california which would give us the transcontinental railway and i think that was done around this time um and, and so, the, again, the, the first set of railways which could go from east to west, as people continued pouring into the United States, which they're doing, I mean, I've had the time unpaused, and even in just this segment, there's been two migrations. Unfortunately, we lost Alaska, which kind of sucks, uh, because eh, it's just kind of a lame event, actually, where, for me, Russia has never gone bankrupt, where, where I can offer to buy Alaska from them. Anyway, I kind of sidetracked a little bit there. Um, and you saw the migrations that everybody kept pouring into America as the land of opportunity. And that's certainly the case. Per capita, I mean, there were poor people, lots of poor people. Um, but per capita, the lifestyles in America were just simply were better than you had more opportunity. You had more chance at wealth. Uh, and nothing exemplified that more than the continued push of people headed west the gold rush in California, the Oregon Trail, right? And the the, um, the the railroads really linked the entire country to what it really considered was its future. Let's just keep uh, letting the time roll. Now, one of the other things I want to do, and I think I can do this right away, is in addition to the hopes of uh, the masses, there rose up the titans of industry, and I think we can do one right now. Let's do this. Here we go. Carnegie Steel. Andrew Carnegie was one of the wealthiest people probably in the world, uh, and he was really the king of steel. This time is the time of steel, and uh, we've made it such, such that all of our construction has been switched over to steel frame buildings at this point. We're beginning to see our ships moved over to steel clads, iron clads and, and steel. And so with steel being as big as it is and was, I'm really happy to have Carnegie Steel 
uh, be a legitimate company. And we're all set up to be increasing uh, productivity uh, through Carnegie Steel. And so that really represents the, the, the titans of industry. So I'm going to continue pushing this forward. Maybe what we'll do is we'll say a little goodbye. This video is supposed to come to an end at 1890. Um, there's not really a whole lot of other uh, instances. So let's go ahead and fast forward to that time frame right now. Oh, but I stalled you long enough to see the first transcontinental railway uh, be completed. What do we want to do? Yeah, the West Coast will be just as prosperous in the East. Why not? So this is what was going on in the United States at this time. The growth of business, the growth of railway, the growth of population, the growth of industry. And so another thing that I'm going to be doing over the next 16 years is really beginning a conversion uh, of our mechanisms, of our industry, away from the unskilled labor section and more towards the skilled labor section. Uh, which is going to use like the mechanics and the engineers. Uh, and, and what we will hopefully then see is the rise of the trade unions. So I'm going to be working to push this uh, by way of converting all of the buildings as much as we can. Like, see, this is a good one. Can we go ahead and do this? Yeah, you know what? Let's, let's, why not, right? So we're going to start this increase the productivity. Um, decreased labor, uh, which of course increased profits, uh, and ultimately led to what the trade unions began to see as a, a huge gap. That there were people like Andrew Carnegie who had insane amount of wealth, and then there was your average worker, ignoring the fact that they had full time employment and jobs. Uh, but it was kind of like, well, why can't I have what that guy has? Uh, and so the the grumpiness grew. So we're going to try and steer this um, trade union pop population up and up and up and up to, uh, by the end of this video, 1890. Let's fast forward to that time now. Here we are in the year 1890. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get this wrapped up, this video. This is where I wanted to stop uh, for this in this particular time frame. So let's go ahead and, well, I'd, I'd really like to see electricity come in here. But it looks like we're not. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what companies we've got. I do have three companies. And um, Carnegie Steel is a big, important one that, that's doing very, very well. So I'm happy about that. Again, that's a true historical company. One that should be in place around this time that isn't, another big biggie, Rockefeller, Standard Oil, should be in place. And then next video, we're going to hopefully look a lot more towards farming another very famous American company, Ford Motor Company. So I'm kind of bummed that uh, I'm making so much money. <laughs> not really. I'm not bummed about that, I guess. I do need to, I don't know, spend more money, build more stuff. Let's see what our... GDP is. GDP hasn't quite had the kind of big spike that it that it should, and I'm at 1140 construction. But anyway, so we we succeeded pretty well in the goal of getting more industrialized. And uh, I really was wishing that we could do more with oil and standard oil specifically. So we went ahead trying to build some electrical um, this is not working. And this is an interesting problem that you have playing Victoria 3, which is this chicken and the egg kind of nobody's using electricity, so nobody needs electricity. And therefore, these companies just kind of sit here and do absolutely nothing. Now, I think I can go in, for example, and switch over my urban center, this is why I built one of the first ones in New York, two electric street lights. And then immediately you'll see our electrical demand will go boom in terms of the uh, the price, right? So let's go back and look at what, our, what that does to our power plant. And so, you know, in theory that gets handled pretty well. So we should hopefully see some employment here, which is good. We're starting to see that. 
And so this electrical will grow over time. <laughs> we're the number one power plant in the country. We're the only power plant in the country, which means that's the reason why we're number one, right? So you have to do this kind of little juggle thing like need, demand, need, demand, need, demand, supply, demand, supply, demand, which is probably not only historically accurate, but probably pretty economically accurate as well. Um, we saw that happen. You see that it, it doesn't really matter what game you're playing history-wise. You see that happen with like railroads. And oil is kind of another one. So I think we've got some oil pumps in Texas. Where are you at? <clears throat> Uh, true to style, I probably scrolled all the way by it. There we go. So we have full employment on our oil rigs, but nobody uses them. Nobody uses oil. The only thing that's currently being used by oil is our food industries, oddly enough. Not even sure what's using them. I think it's vacuum canning that uses it. Yeah. And so we have yet to... And I probably should have played this better in terms of historical simulation. We should have delved into oil requiring industries sooner so we could push Standard Oil to the top. Standard Oil went into business, I think, a couple of decades prior to where we are right now. Anyway, I'm just yapping along. Thanks for watching me on this journey. We are going to proceed to the next video. There should be two more Victoria 3 videos. And this next one, we're going to try to include the time period of World War I. And we're going to see America, the United States of America, make a bit more of an international play, starting with the Spanish-American War for Cuba. So come back next time, and we'll talk about that. Thanks for watching.